The topic is the coming apostasy. And what we're going to do, and, and what I hope to do this evening is, we're going to focus on the coming apostasy that is going to occur during the 70th week of Daniel. And my hope is, with the final few minutes of tonight's lesson, we're going to loop back to the dispensation of grace and look at uh, a couple of things that the Apostle Paul warns about, uh, some things that the Lord, of course, uh, communicates to the Apostle Paul regarding apostasy and uh, just uh, hopefully learn some things in that regard. But I wanted to start here in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2. Uh, I do want to read beginning at verse 1, and we're going to read on down through verse 13, so please bear with me. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks all way to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Our Heavenly Father, again, we do thank you for who you are as a loving God, as a merciful God. We thank you, of course, for the gospel of grace and the gospel of Christ and how it is you sent your beloved Son to die for all of our sins so that we might have eternal life, eternally, permanently. We pray now, Lord, that as we look to your word and as we uh, examine the issue of apostasy, uh, may we, of course, have further understanding and enlightenment uh, of what that is. And certainly, even today, in this current dispensation of grace, may we always be on guard and, and always defend uh, the integrity of truth so that uh, we are not found guilty of uh, being a, apostate. And we do ask these things in Christ Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Verse 3 especially is talking about apostasy. Let's read verse 3 real quickly. Let no man deceive you by any means. Now, uh, our topic is not to examine why it is Paul is going to address what it is he is specifically addressing here. It's obvious, according to verse 2, that the Thessalonians are shaken and troubled. And uh, so Paul now is going to address some things to alleviate the fear that the Thessalonians are experiencing. Now, the cause of their fear, uh, the reason that they are shaken and troubled is because, as verse 2 describes, there is, whether by spirit or by word or by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is what? At hand. And then Paul now, in verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means. Those are the three means by which the Thessalonians are being deceived. The Thessalonians were taught in the first epistle that there is an event that we'll look at real quickly called the gathering up of the church. And after learning truths about the, and I will use the word rapture, uh, obviously, Paul would describe it as our catching uh, up with him in the air, but uh, for um, purposes, I'm just going to use the word rapture. The Thessalonians were taught some things about the rapture, the rapture being an event that precedes the day of wrath. Well, 
what's happened here is the Thessalonians now are being taught that that day is at hand. And so the Thessalonians, of course, naturally are, are concerned. Uh, they're now filled with dread. Are they in a period of time that they understood to be a time of wrath? Now, please keep in mind that there was a forged letter that taught false information about the day of Christ. And so whatever information uh, was contained in that letter, they thought they were in this period of wrath, which means they missed this event that they learned about in the first letter. So to make it as simple as possible, they thought they missed the rapture. And as a result, they were in a day in which the outbreak of wrath was occurring. And we want to be extremely careful here. The term day of Christ sometimes is assumed to be the rapture. Be very careful with that. The day of Christ is not just the rapture. The rapture occurs in the day of Christ. We need to make that distinction. So with all of that said, Paul is going to uh, alleviate the, the trouble. Verse 1, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. They didn't miss anything. And that's the point that Paul is going to make. They had no reason to believe, even though there was a false, deceptive, seducing preacher preaching a seductive message, and again, some sort of forged letter that claimed that they missed it. He, of course, there says, listen, by our gathering together unto him, verse 2, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. And that's why Paul is going to address this issue, okay? Again, uh, our scope and, and purpose uh, for this evening's lesson is not to examine all of the details here, okay? But I do want to just uh, point one thing out regarding our gathering together unto him. Turn a, a couple of pages to the left. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Real quick, we want to stress that there is an event that is going to occur that brings the current dispensation of grace to a conclusion. After this event called the rapture, the prophetic program does resume. And Paul's going to provide some information about some events that are going to happen. We'll talk about that in just a second. But notice, for, for example, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to what? Wrath. But to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul is not talking about soul salvation here. By the way, how did Jesus Christ save the sinner onto eternal life? Did he not personally intervene on the sinner's behalf and died as his father's propitiation for our sins? When it comes to our soul salvation, the Lord Jesus personally intervened on our behalf, did he not? So read verse 9 again. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. Please keep in mind, this is the prophetic wrath that concerns the, this time of Jacob's trouble. It includes the seven-year tribulation, so on and so forth. And so what Paul is stressing here is that is not what God appointed us unto, but rather to obtain salvation. So there is a salvation from impending wrath. How are we going to be saved from that impending future wrath? By our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord and Savior is personally going to intervene to ensure that we will not enter into that period called wrath. I want you to appreciate that for just a second. 
The Lord Jesus was so personally involved in our soul salvation, He is equally personally involved to ensure that His body, His church, will not go through a time of prophetic, prophetic wrath. How does He do that? The end of verse 10, uh, verse 9, by our Lord Jesus. You know what He's going to do? Glance back to chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord Himself... Now, can he get any more touching than that? That's how he's going to ensure the body of Christ is going to be saved. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be, here we go, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And now the Thessalonians received a forged letter that is communicating to them that, wait a minute, the time of wrath is at hand, okay? Now, again, let's go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're not going to deal with the issue of the use of the term day of Christ, okay? But what Paul's going to do is he's going to talk about that day. Remember, this is false information. This is false doctrine about the day of Christ, okay? Hence, Paul says in verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means for that day, okay? And now Paul is going to proceed to describe some events that demonstrate that the rapture has not taken place, okay? The point in this section here is to demonstrate we are not in that day and to demonstrate that that day only comes after these events that Paul's going to lay out here. And Paul's also going to demonstrate that that 70th week of Daniel can't even begin as long as the body of Christ is on the earth. To keep it simple, the rapture is still imminent. And that's the point that Paul's going to make. So, for sake of time, let's talk about what events are going to happen in the future again after the church is caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Now, do you see that word falling away? That's where we get the word apostasy. The Greek word is apostasia, and uh, hence the title, the coming apostasy. Then the verse goes on, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who ultimately, verse 4, is going to exalt himself and he's going to be worshipped, showing himself that he is God. That's the 70th week of Daniel in one verse. Okay. Now, this coming apostasy, when we talk about the falling away first, there's a lot of different ideas about, well, what exactly is the falling away? And, uh, you know, there are good brothers in Christ, uh, good Bible students that, uh, you know, have uh, some ideas and, and some teaching and they support it with Scripture. And I'm certainly not seeking to belittle uh, some of the insight that these men have uh, in God's Word. Uh, but uh, it, the falling away is not the rapture, okay? Uh, we need to exercise tremendous care. The rapture is not an apostasy. <laughs> is the rapture a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, it's a good thing. By the way, if the rapture takes place and you're still on earth and the day of Christ is taking place, good thing or a bad thing? You understand why the Thessalonians were freaking out? The day of Christ, why are we still on the earth? If you're in the day of Christ and you're on earth, not a good thing. Where do you want to be? You want to be there with the rest of the church of the body of Christ, gathered together with him, okay? So the falling away is not the rapture. Well, then, what is it? And uh, I hope that we'll look at a few things for me. 
The falling away is not necessarily a single event. However, the falling away will lead to an event that results in the man of sin being revealed. Okay, let me say it like that. I am not convinced that the falling away is any one single event, but the falling away does result in an event. Frankly, the falling away is the spiritual environment that is going to continue through the entire 70th week, as hopefully we'll uh, demonstrate here. The falling away, it's going to set the stage for the man of sin. This falling away is going to provide a spiritual environment that allows the man of sin to carry out his policy of evil, eventually the man of sin becoming the son of perdition, who is ultimately going to sit in the temple and he's going to show himself to be God. The great lie. Okay, So, let's look at this falling away, again, if we think about it as something that will prevail, it's a, a spirit, it's a spiritual environment that is going to prevail during the course of this 70th week. Uh, for me, it, it, it helps bring a little more clarity, okay? A couple of verses that I like to go to. Now, now before we go anywhere else, drop down to verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the what? Truth. And I think we're going to find out. Truth can be used in the general sense, right? Thy word is what? Truth, right? Sanctify them with thy, thy word, thy, uh, thy truth, thy word is truth. Um, and, and certainly uh, there will be uh, the masses who will reject the truth at large. However, uh, there could also be a specific truth that the masses are not going to receive. Now, reading verse 10 again, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Be careful with that one. It isn't as though God is, is deliberately, intentionally going to make you believe a lie, but rather He's going to do some things because He's going to give to humanity what humanity has always desired and what humanity has always sought. You know, Brother uh, David, earlier he used that passage there in 1 Kings. And you remember that God sent a lying spirit? Listen, that was the condition of the nation of Israel at the outset. So uh, be, be a little careful here when God uh, is described as sending strong delusion. He's giving humanity what they've always sought and desired. He's going to meet their demand. And, and He's going to satisfy that which is in their heart. Okay? And there are a number of verses that demonstrate that, okay? Verse 12, and they all, that they all might be damned who believe not the what? There's that truth again. Apostasy is a rejection. They refuse. They will not receive the what? The truth. Fundamentally, that is what apostasy is. It is willful, deliberate intentional rejection of the truth. They hear it and they receive it not. And so God is going to respond in the way He does during that 70th week of Daniel. And if you're not familiar with the language, the 70th week of Daniel, you definitely got to attend Brother Kenny's uh, seminar. He's dealing with uh, the issues of the head of gold all the way to the son of perdition. By the way, that's a lot of uh, ground to cover in one hour. The 70th week of Daniel is that remaining week that Daniel chapter 9 describes. 69, year, uh, 69 week of years have already occurred historically. There is one week remaining, a 
seven year period of time. Okay? It is in that period of time that God sends strong delusion, simply giving to man what he so desires. Okay? Let's just go through some verses here and get a feel for the landscape in the future. Now remember, where is the body of Christ when all of this is happening? We're out of here, okay? So what is going to happen out there in the future? I wanted to start in Matthew chapter 24, and, and we're going to run some verses here. So we're going to move rather quickly here. Matthew chapter 24. And uh, notice there, Matthew chapter 24, let's just pick it up at verse 3. Matthew 24, verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? Now the Lord, he described how the uh, temple is going to be destroyed, so on and so forth. And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered us unto, uh, unto them, Take heed that no man do what? Deceive you. So the question is, well, what is the sign of thy coming? It's a, the question is, when is this all going to happen? What is the sign of thy coming? And the Lord Jesus, he does something real touching here. He isn't going to address necessarily all of the, the, the political landscape, the environmental landscape, or the economic landscape. Uh, what we find the Lord Jesus, he's concerned about the little flock, which is, of course, what the good shepherd does, right? He's got his believing remnant. He's got his faithful, uh, uh, believing uh, uh, flock. And so he's now going to prepare and equip his faithful remnant for some future events here, okay? So the first thing he's going to warn about is, in verse 4, take heed that no man what? There's going to be mass deception in the future in such degree and with such intensity that it would be possible for even the elect to fall victim to this deception. In fact, in this chapter, uh, look at verse 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall what? Deceive many. Look there at verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall, here we go again, deceive many. Verse 24. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall, what is this? Deceive. Listen, there's going to be an intense campaign of deceit. And that's the first thing Jesus Christ is going to address. One of the means of deception, go back to verse 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am who? Now, the Lord here is not talking about people who are mentally ill. And by the way, I remember back in the early 80s, I met a man who literally believed he was Jesus Christ. He was mentally ill. You go to Pacific Guard Mission, in Chicago, downtown Chicago, you, you meet a lot of mentally ill people. Uh, back in the mid-90s, remember we had uh, Michael, the archangel, attending Shore. I don't know if you were there at the time. Uh, you know, and so you, you, know, you comfort the feeble-minded. They're, they're not mentally bad. The Lord Jesus is not suggesting that in the future you're going to have a lot of mentally ill people claiming to be Christ. In what sense are they claiming to be Christ? Notice how he intensifies that. Drop down again real quickly to verse 23. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. Verse 24. For there shall arise false. Why? What is it with all of these false Christ? We need to appreciate the spiritual environment in which we find the little flock experiencing in the future. There is a deception that is going to try to trick the little flock into believing that this first coming, the so-called coming of Messiah, as we know about it 2,000 years ago, was a complete fabrication. He's a fraud. 
He wasn't the real Messiah. He was never the real Christ. He is not the so-called self-proclaimed anointed of Jehovah God. So you know what's going to happen in the future? There are going to be individuals who are going to rise up claiming to be what the Old Testament was prophesying concerning a coming Messiah. And it's going to be so bad, if you notice that in verse 24 again, there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and what? Wonders. Did Jesus Christ perform signs and wonders when he made the claim regarding his identity? So, so just, just remember that. It has nothing to do with people that are mentally imbalanced. It has to do with individuals that are going to present themselves as the fulfillment of all the prophetic scriptures regarding the coming of Messiah. Now, with that in mind, uh, let's go over to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Now, now, you know what? Before you go there, go back real quick. I, I, let me point something else out really quick. Hopefully, you're still there in Matthew 24, right? Now, we're not going through all of this, but, but as, as Lord Jesus begins to describe some things in verse 4, he's going to talk about, uh, you know, uh, many are going to come in my name, saying, I am Christ. Verse 6, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Interestingly enough, this uh, parallels some things that Daniel chapter 11 is going to be or, or has prophesied about. There are going to be some wars that precede the rise of this individual that I'm going to call the Antichrist. Paul calls him the man of sin. There are some wars that are going to happen according to prophecy before the revelation of the man of sin. So here you have the Lord. He's talking about wars and rumors of wars and so on. Verse 7, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Now look at what the Lord Jesus says. All of these are the, all these are the beginning of what? Sorrows. Sorrows. Verse 9, then. Now, the Lord Jesus he shifts his attention on his faithful flock. Then shall they what? Deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. Something happens in verse 9 that triggers this attempt to begin to exterminate this believing remnant. And the Lord now, he's warning his faithful. Listen, something's going to happen to you guys. And he's going to equip them. He's going to prepare with them. Of course, verse 13, he says, uh, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved and so forth. So just for me, it's touching that the Lord is concerned about his people. He says there in verse 9, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted. What in the world happens that now results in this intense persecution to afflict and to kill the believing remnant, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. The real Christ, okay? Now keep this in mind real quickly. You're going to have false Christ out there making some claims. You're going to have the believing remnant that is going to resist that deceit. And they're going to believe in the first coming the true Christ who already did come in the flesh and now hostility is concentrated on this people group that claim to believe that Christ already came from our perspective approximately 2,000 years ago. Go to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Verse 9 I think is the start of the seventh week. Anyway, Hebrews chapter 6. Go to Hebrews chapter 6. And uh, we need to recognize that the book of Hebrews parallels the book of Acts. Okay? It, it's so clear. Uh, the Hebrew epistles pick up where the early Acts period ends. Okay? And, and there are just these parallels. We're going to hopefully examine two clear parallels in the book of Hebrews 
that, that we, we actually see in the early Acts period. With that, Hebrews chapter 6, look through at verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away, and I am not suggesting that this falling away is the same thing that Paul's referring to, but there is a parallel here. And there's something that I really want to point out. Verse 6, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance. Now, historically, the nation of Israel, they did fall away. From what? Notice verse 6. If they fall, if they shall fall away. Fall away from what? Look there at verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. And by the way, this is past tense. And have tasted of the heavenly gift. And were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. And have tasted the good word of God. And the powers of the world to come. Historically, verse 4 and verse 5 occurred in the opening chapters of the book of Acts. And we're not going to go through all the details, but what we find in the opening chapters of the book of Acts is the Pentecostal witness regarding the identity of Messiah. You have the 12 apostles, you have the Holy Spirit who is witnessing and testifying to the claims of Jesus Christ's Messiahship. And the warning in verse 6, if they shall what? Fall away. Nationally, Israel lost the opportunity for any future repentance. God understand that. That opportunity for repentance was legitimately offered in early Acts chapters 1 through 7. But when Israel nationally rejected the witness, and certainly we're going to see some things about Stephen. Well, here's the, the predicament. Verse 6, if they shall fall away to renew them again on repentance, notice, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame you know what's the connection there to reject the witness and the testimony that was given specifically in early acts nationally israel fell away they rejected all of that and to do so is according to verse 6 likened unto Viewing the cross as absolutely meaningless. Viewing the cross as a waste. Viewing the cross, as the verse says, they crucify to themselves. Listen, these rejectors are identifying themselves with the very ones who crucified their king. We have no king but who, Israel declared. Didn't Israel say, his blood beware? On our hands, those who fall away, they're linked to the spirit that is described as being responsible for the crucifixion of the Son of God. What they're doing simply is this. These individuals falling away from the testimony, they are putting themselves in the very same position of those who deliberately rejected the claims that were made by the Lord Jesus as being God's Messiah. They're doing the very same thing. The message that is going to be preached by apostate Israel has everything to do with the rejection of the claims of Jesus in history past. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, and let's start at verse 1. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people even as there shall be false teachers among you 
who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be what? Evil spoken of. What specific truth is being evil spoken of? Look at the end of verse 1. Even denying the Lord that bought them. There is the specific truth that is being committed by apostate Israel that is certainly going to happen out there in the future that sets the stage and provides this environment that leads to this man of sin and a covenant that Israel is going to enter into with him. And at that signing, it's called the covenant of death. And at that signing, the tables are turning against God's faithful flock. Now, a couple more verses in this regard. Uh, go over to uh, 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Uh, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18. 1 John chapter 2 verse 18. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come... Even now are there many antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Drop down to verse 21. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. What truth? Verse 22. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the who? The Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father. Drop, go over to chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. That's a reference to the actual first coming of Jesus of Nazareth. It's Emmanuel, God with us, who appears the first time. Now, what is the spirit of Antichrist teaching? He's a fraud. He's a fake. He's a phony. Well, if he was a fraud and a fake, then what's happening at the beginning of the 70th week? There are going to be many Christ out there they're the ones who are claiming to fill the shoes and to fit the blueprint or the fingerprint, the forensic evidence that the prophets provide regarding the identity of Messiah. They're claiming we're the one. And there's going to be a bunch of them out there. Uh, keep reading verse 3. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof <clears throat> ye have heard that it should come. And even now uh, already is, uh, is it in the world. Uh, drop down to verse 6. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of what? What is the truth? Jesus did come. Messiah did appear. He came in the flesh. And of course, Hebrews is going to demonstrate the reason for all of that. Drop down to verse 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. <clears throat> Here in His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and has sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sin. Is knowing that Jesus, who came and made the claim as Israel's Messiah, critically important did he die why did he die 
He died as a propitiation. The spirit of Antichrist is going to deny that truth. And the spirit of Antichrist is now going to offer another message and opportunity. If you go to 2 John, go to 2 John and verse 7. 2 John verse 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and a what? Anti-Christ. Now, for me, the falling away has to do with this message that is denying the first coming, which started in the book of Acts, but again, there's a parallel back there in the book of Hebrews. And this message that denies what he did leads to the apostate nation of Israel entering into an agreement. Let's go to Daniel chapter 9. Go to Daniel chapter 9. Because the nation of Israel now, they are seeking to re-implement or re-institute this mosaic system of animal sacrifice. If Jesus didn't do it, and, and I know we're not going to have any time, but, but if you go through the book of you know how often the book of Hebrews is communicating that all of those animal sacrifices were absolutely of no spiritual avail when it comes to paying for the sins of the world. And so what the Hebrew writer is doing is, is contrasting the sacrificial system of the past with the only one true sacrifice to enter into this covenant which now stipulates that Israel can function in the temple. And the reason there is the temple, and it obviously is rebuilt, is for apostate Israel to once again resume the offering up of animal sacrifices, which is a direct denial of the work of the true Messiah who died for Israel's sins. And, and, and that's the spirit of Antichrist. Uh, Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 9. As uh, we, we learn here, and, and we're just going to break right into the context. Verse 27, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now, that's going to be the man of sin. And by the way, that's how you're going to identify him. Uh, how, how can Israel identify the man of sin? How is he revealed? Well, he's going to confirm the covenant with many for how long? What, that's the remaining 70th week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the, the what? The sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Number of verses in the book of Dan, what we learn is this. Uh, animal sacrifices are being offered. Where? In the temple. That is a clear denial of what the book of Hebrews is going to clearly demonstrate, all of that animal blood ultimately didn't avail. Jesus is the one true sacrifice. There's a spirit that leads Israel into that agreement whereby the temple is built and the system of sacrifice is once again set up. The temple. Go to John chapter 4. I want, I, I want to just point something out here. Book of John. John chapter 4. The temple. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the book of Hebrews is going to say some things about all of this, this offering up of animal sacrifice and so forth. This issue of the temple. You know, the Lord actually, and we're going to, he actually begins his public ministry preparing the little flock for something that is going to happen in that temple. And he's actually going to educate, obviously, his faithful remnant, don't be a part of it. Now, now in John chapter 4, notice what he says here at verse 19. John chapter 4 and verse 19. 
The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers... Question, will the true worshipers be worshiping in Jerusalem? Well, isn't Jerusalem the city of the great king? Just appreciate what the Lord Jesus is doing here. The true worshipers shall worship the Father how? in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. Did you catch the connection? Yeah, there's going to come a day, all right. True worshipers, you better not be worshiping God where? There's a problem in Jerusalem. The book of Revelation will tell you there's a problem in Jerusalem. There is somebody occupying the temple. And, and you understand the Lord Jesus, he said, listen, when that abomination of desolation appears there in the middle of that week, according to the book of Daniel, what is the, nation, what is the faithful remnant supposed to do? Get out of town. Something is wrong. Go to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Uh, Matthew chapter 23. At the end of the Lord's ministry, Matthew chapter 23, verse 38. Behold... Your, well, look at verse 37. O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem. Now, verse 38. Behold, your house is left unto you how? And guess who's going to move in? Chapter 27 and uh, verse 51. Chapter 27 and verse 51. Chapter 27, verse 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. You understand what happened there, right? From top to bottom, why was that veil rent? It's empty. It's, it's, it's empty. The house is left what? Desolate. Now go to Acts chapter 6, and we're flying, aren't we? <laughs> and I do apologize, but it's okay. Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. And you understand Stephen, filled with the Holy Ghost, right? Acts chapter 6. You know what one of the accusations that were hurled against Stephen by the religious leadership of apostate Israel? Look there in Acts chapter 6. And if you notice there at verse 8, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among uh, uh, the people and so forth. And, and if you drop down verse 11, Then they suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses, which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. Why were they accusing Stephen of, of making the claim that this place is going to be what? Destroyed. What was Stephen's defense against that accusation? Go to chapter 7 and drop down to verse 49. Chapter 7 to verse 49. Verse, well, verse 48, verse 48. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? He's going to be stoned to death. One of the last things that Stephen says regarding the temple. Is God there? In Jerusalem? In the temple? You know what Stephen, you know what the Holy Spirit is doing? He's communicating the apostate nation of Israel. God's out of here. And you can't worship Him 
in the temple. The true worshipers, the, little, the believing remnant, they're not going to worship God in the temple. The temple is occupied by God's mortal enemy. He is, we're going to buy way he, he is going to be that antichrist. He's going to be the son of perdition. Now, uh, notice there in verse 48. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Go to Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah chapter 66. And, and what we have here is a prophecy regarding God's view of the future and what apostate Israel will be doing during the 70th week of Daniel. When that temple is rebuilt and that system of animal sacrifice is, is reinstituted, uh, Hebrews is authorizing and actually instructing the little flock, don't go there. In fact, there are some verses uh, in the book of Psalms that clearly instruct the little flock, don't go to that temple. The only sacrifices God is interested in is the sacrifice of your lips, not the animal blood sacrifices that are taking place. Now, Isaiah chapter 66. You ever heard Isaiah being called the Bible in miniature? Uh, every chapter of the book of Isaiah would correlate or correspond to every book of the Bible, right? Isaiah 66, last chapter in Isaiah. What book would that correspond with? The book of Revelation. Now, notice verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made, and all these things have, have uh, 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 I'm sorry, uh, verse 2, For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, uh, have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit. And Did the Lord say anything in his first public message about the poor in spirit? Wow, when you connect Isaiah 66, there is this subtle, the Lord Jesus is quoting a verse in Matthew chapter 5 taken out of Isaiah 66. Okay, what's the significance here? Verse 3, he that killeth an ox is, is as if he slew a man. He that sacrificeth a lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offereth an oblation, as if he offered swine's blood. He that burneth incense, as if he blessed an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delighteth in their abominations. I also will choose their, what? Delusions. Wow. The Apostle Paul talks about God sending a strong delusion. What are the delusions that Isaiah is talking about in verse 4? Verse 3. What, what is verse 3 describing? Isn't it describing animal sacrifice? Did God prescribe animal sacrifices? Well, isn't this an odd thing for God to say about His opinion of animal sacrifice? Now, in light of the future, this is a prophecy, okay? This is clearly... Look at verse 5. Hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word. Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake. Didn't the Lord Jesus say, and then they're going to persecute you, and they're going to kill you, and the nations are going to rise up, and they're going to try to exterminate you, little flock. That little flock is standing against and opposed to the abomination that is happening there in Jerusalem. They speak out against that imposter claiming to be God at the risk of being killed. And the book of Revelation describes some horrific, torturous, bloody martyrdom out there in the future. But you connect all of this. Verse 3 God's view of what's going to happen in the future. 
all of that animal blood that's being sacrificed, it's satanic. And the little flock, they're the ones who tremble at God's word. They're the ones with the poor spirit. They're the ones that take heed to the warnings that are given in the book of Hebrews. We're going to end it. Go to Hebrews chapter 13. The, oh, well, the book of Hebrews especially. Now, the Hebrew epistles are going to provide a wealth of information intended to equip the little flock not to participate in the abomination that's happening there in the midst of the nation of Israel at the hands of man of sin, of course, that's ultimately going to be manifest as the son of perdition. Hebrews chapter 13. And notice there, beginning at verse uh, 11, uh, Hebrews chapter 13, now let's read verse 9. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them, that have been uh, occupied therein. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered where? Without the, Hebrews is deliberately making all of these critical contrasts between what's happening in the abominable temple and the animal and what Jesus did do for his people. Look at verse 13. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing what? City. But we seek one to come. That's going to be that new Jerusalem that's going to des descend. Verse 15, by him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. The sacrifice of what? Praise to God. Book of Psalms says a great deal about this. God says, I want the calf, I want the sacrifice of calves, the calves of your lips. In light of that bloody religion, that vain, meaningless, empty, vain apostate system. You know what the little flock, you go out. And you offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. The apostasy that's going to rage out there in the future ultimately is and fundamentally is the denial of what Messiah did do when he died in the flesh. And it's going to be a message that's claiming that that was a complete fabrication and absolute fraud. And the real Christ is where? In Jerusalem. And the real Christ is in the temple. And that bloody system of animal sacrifice has been reinstituted. Now, interestingly enough, the Antichrist is going to turn and he's going to demolish that religious system. I want to end in one verse. One more verse. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I, I really wanted to loop back to some things that the Apostle Paul has to say. And, and I'm going to be done. I do not want the wrath of Cynthia to fall upon me, <laughs> nor my wife. By the way, my, my wife is up there too. She's been there every day and night. And, and, and something here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And, and if we begin reading there at verse 14, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? You know, this is the only time in the New Testament that that title name is used, Belial or Belial. And who's the one who uses it? The Apostle Paul. Belial. It has its, it's intimately connected to Baal worship going all the way back there in the book of Genesis. And if you study Baal worship, ultimately you find it in Revelation chapter 17, Mystery Babylon. The Apostle Paul makes a, Belial, it's a title. It means Lord or Master of what? Lord or Master of what? Religion. 
And it's interesting the, interesting, the Apostle Paul, verse 15, And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the what? The unclean thing is a reference to the Babylonian system that is operating when Paul is writing this letter to who? The Corinthians. Now, it may not be called Baal worship because there are many flavors, there are many uh, shades, uh, there are many, uh, many modes of, of this system, but, but Baal worship is alive and well when Paul writes. And if you examine some of the characteristics of this system, we, you know, Paul talks about the table, he talks about the bread, he talks about the cup, he talks about communion, he talks about idols, he talks about angels, he talks about... I mean, wait a minute. That system of Baal worship is identifiable back in Genesis, Deuteronomy, 1 Samuel. It's identifiable 2,000 years ago at Corinth. Can I say to you, it is still identifiable today. You call them father, they're priests, they wear robes, they get paid, they have victuals, they have communion, they have a cup, they have bread, they, they worship idols, they worship angels. It's alive and well, folks. My mom came out of that, and I'm so glad she didn't drag me into that system. But my point is this, bell worship is alive and well today. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. So I wanted to close saying a few things about that. God is a jealous God. Two times, Paul refers to God being jealous in his epistles. In each occurrence, it has everything to do with practicing Baal worship. Now, it may not be called Baal worship, but when you read what's going on, it is ba God says, I am jealous. When it comes to the believer today participating in modern-day Baal worship, God says, I'm jealous. You know what it means to be jealous? Doesn't our love and affection and devotion, shouldn't it be focused and concentrated on our God and Father? And if we're committing fornication with the religious system, mystery Babylon, the great harlot, the great whore who made the people drink from the cup of her fornication. Isn't that interesting? When Paul describes God being jealous, it's in light of Baal worship. And we know that Baal worship seeks to lure the believer into the fornication of religion. Okay? So... We certainly need to be careful not to be seduced into a system that is operating today. And it may not be exactly as we, you know, see it, in, in, but it's still alive and well. Father, we do thank you for your grace and for your love. We do thank you, Father, for your word and, and who we are in Christ and, and how it is we, we certainly can uh, faithfully adhere to the doctrine that you've given to us. May we be careful not to depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. May we be aware of, of how it is the adversary works even today and how it all culminates out there into the future, into that manifestation of, of that uh, mystery Babylon who, who is actually riding uh, that beast. Uh, we just thank you for your word in Christ's name.